Assalamu alaikum, dear brothers and sisters, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to welcome you to uh, the continuation of our tafsir of Surah Al Rum. Uh, we had uh, quite a long break uh, with the month of Ramadan. And uh, we'll, we'll be resuming today, uh, picking up where we left off uh, at verse uh, number 31. But because of the extended break, let me just kind of give you a quick uh, a summary of, uh, of what we've covered so far. As you know, uh, Surah Ar-Rum is a Meccan Surah, and it begins with uh, a promise, a divine promise of a victory that will take place in the future. غُلِبَتُ الرُّومِ فِي أَدْنَ الْأَرْضِ وَهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ غَلَبِهِمْ سَيَغْلِبُونَ The Romans were defeated. And the Romans, of course, they were a Christian empire. The Romans were defeated. And when the Romans were defeated, the polytheists of Mecca, the Mushrikeen of Mecca, took that as a good omen. That in the same way that the, the Ahlul Kitab, the people of the book, were vanquished, the Muslims, who also claim to be uh, recipients of divine revelation, will also be vanquished. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the Romans have been, been defeated. في أدنى الأرض, in a nearby land. وهم من بعد غلبهم سيغلبون. But after their defeat, they shall, they shall soon be victorious. Now, the theme of this surah is the idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has absolute control over all things. That many people fail to understand this reality because they're blinded by the the chains of causes and effects. They are an, unable to see the hand of God behind all of these phenomena. And therefore you find that the verse speaks about this divine promise and the promise of God, you know, as the, as the ayah says that, that God never breaks his promise because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has control over all things. And then the verse, the surah transitions to a discussion on the signs of God's power. You know, most people fail to realize this reality because as, as the surah says, uh, as one of the verses says in the beginning of the surah, يَعْلَمُونَ ظَاهِرًا مِنَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا That people fail to perceive these truths because they only know a an, one aspect of the apparent reality of this world. Their knowledge is uh, is deficient. يَعْلَمُونَ ظَاهِرًا مِنَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا They only know some of the apparent aspects of this earthly life. So God's power is reflected in the created order. His existence is reflected in the created order. And then verse number 30. So there was a discussion about the ayat, the signs of God's power, his majesty, his presence in the external world. But one of the greatest signs of God's existence is what is known as the fitrah. That's why in, in verse number 30, Allah says, فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكِ لِلدِّينِ حَنِيفًا فِطْرَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي فَطْرَ النَّاسَ عَلَيْهَا So you have all of these external indicators of God's power, of His existence, His majesty. But we also have this internal sign this internal sign of God, and that is known as the fitra. So verse 30 spoke about this primordial, the primordial nature of human beings, this innate knowledge that we have of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just to kind of uh, complete that, uh, that discussion, there are a few ahadith uh, from the Ahlul Bayt alayhimu salatu wassalam, where they speak and they, they explain what this 
fitra is because the fitra, this primordial uh, nature is within every human being. There's a hadith from the Prophet where he says, Kullu mawludin yuladu ala al-fitra. That every newborn child possesses this, this innate knowledge, this unmediated recognition of a higher power. And then the Prophet says, this, the meaning of this fitra is, يعني المعرفة بأن الله عز وجل خالق That it's the, the recognition, this awareness, the, the knowledge that God, that Allah is their creator. Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, when he comments on verse number 30 of Surah Al-Rum, he says, فِطْرَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي فَطْرَ النَّاسَ عَلَيْهَا This fitra, that is, it's, a, it's endowed by God in the, the, uh, the hearts of people. This is a reference to فَطَرَ اللَّهُ الْخَلْقَ عَلَى مَعْرِفَتِهِ That God has created us with this predisposition, with this presential knowledge of Him. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam takes it even a step further and he says فَطَرَهُمْ عَلَى التَّوْحِيد that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has endowed us with this presential unmediated knowledge of God's oneness. So not only are we born with a recognition of a higher power, we are born with the recognition that that higher power is singular, that he's one. فَطَرَهُمْ عَلَى التَّوْحِيد And in Surah Al-A'raf, there is a, a verse that, uh, that speaks to this, you know, this, this sort of you know, pre-temporal covenant between God and human beings. Allah says in ayah number 172 of Surah Al-A'raf, وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمَ مِنْ ظُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ قَالُوا بَلَىٰ That this verse speaks about an encounter, a sort of covenant between Allah and all human beings before this physical world. Some refer to it as the world of particles, alam al dhar There was a sort of acknowledgement of God, that Allah introduces Himself. There was an acceptance of His, His Lordship. And therefore you find the narrations say, ثُبِتَتْ الْمَعْرِفَةُ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ That because of this encounter, because of this uh, this uh, this pre-temporal covenant, this mithaq between Allah Azza wa Jal and creation and human beings, the ma'rifah of Allah was implanted and solidified in the hearts of people. وَنَسُوا الْمَوْقِفِ the, the narrations say that people have forgotten that encounter. وَسَيَذْكُرُونَهُ يَوْمًا مَا But they will recall it one day. You know, many people, they say that if this took place, I don't remember it. You know, how, how can you say that there was this encounter if I don't remember that it took place? Well, obviously, the, the answer to that is that there are many things that happen in our lives that, that we don't remember. So the fact that we don't remember is, is not evidence that it didn't happen. Many of us, for example, don't remember what we ate last week. It doesn't mean that, that, that it didn't happen. So our failure to remember this momentous encounter that, that predated this physical world does not negate the fact that it took place. So it was this encounter. So the hadith says, If it wasn't for that, that pre- uh, this, that pre-temporal covenant between Allah and human beings, وَلَوْلَا ذَلِكْ لَمْ يَدْرِ أَحَدٌ مَنْ خَالِقُهُ وَمَنْ رَازِقُهُ If it wasn't for that, 
encounter. If it wasn't for that conversation between Allah and the souls of all people who are to be born in this earthly life, no one, no human being would have known his Lord or uh, who his uh, sustainer and, uh, and provider is. So that's verse number 30. So turn your face to the, the upright religion. Of, of Allah that is within all human beings. This is not something that, that can be changed. Meaning that we are all born with this presential knowledge of God. Now verse number 31 continues this this conversation of the fitra. So I want you to see the, the logical flow and the structure of the surah. So the surah begins with the, the declaration that the Romans have been defeated. And then there is a divine promise that the Romans will be victorious after their defeat. And this is a divine promise. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who can make such a promise because he has absolute authority over, over creation. He has full control. And then, you know, how do we know that God has full control? How do we know about his knowledge and his power and his presence? Allah mentions various signs of, of his power, of his knowledge throughout creation. And then there's a discussion about the fitra, which is an internal sign of God. And then you have verse number 31 where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says munibina ilayhi wattaqū wa aqīmu as-salāta wa lā takūnū min al-mushrikīn turning to him and be conscious of him have taqwa and establish the prayer and do not be among those who associate partners with God do not be among the polytheists. Now, verse number 30 spoke about this presential knowledge, this innate recognition that we have of God. Now, that innate recognition is not just, it, that has a purpose. That the fitra has a purpose. This innate recognition of God has a function. And that function is that it is meant to serve as an impetus to seek him. Munibina ilay. So this fitra has a has a role, you know, just like every organ in your body has a function, it was created for a purpose. That elementary knowledge of God, that unmediated recognition of God has a function, and that function is that it was meant to push you towards God so that you can turn to him. Munibina ilay. It comes from the word inaba, which means to turn back to God, to turn to Him in repentance or to reorient yourself to Him. Munibina ilay. Now, when a human being turns to God and ponders over the perfection and the, the unlimited nature of His Lord, it's only natural that you ask yourself, okay, what is my responsibility towards this, this creator? That he created me, I see the signs of his, his, uh, his majesty and his authority throughout the, the created order. I have this, this, uh, <clears throat> this natural inclination towards him. When you recognize God, there's the second command is what? To have taqwa, to be conscious of him. And taqwa, you know, loosely defined is to observe his, the obligations that he has mandated and to refrain from that which he has prohibited. So taqwa really boils down to fulfilling the wajibat and avoiding the muharramat. This is what it means to have taqwa, to be God conscious, to be conscious of what he expects from you, and to also be conscious of what you need to stay away from, what you need to guard yourself from, 
what you need to refrain from. Now after taqwa, so taqwa is this kind of this comprehensive concept, this all-encompassing attitude, this all-encompassing uh, guide for how we should behave in our relationship with God. We fulfill all of the wajibat and we avoid the muharramat. So Allah says, Munibina ilayhi wa taqu, have taqwa wa aqimu salah. So taqwa is the totality of what Allah has obligated, and it is the totality of what Allah has commanded us to stay away from, the, the totality of His prohibitions. Now, among the the obligations among the divine commandments, salah is mentioned. Salah is singled out and is mentioned. Why? And you'll notice in this verse, so taqwa is the totality of awamir, of what God has commanded us to do, and it is the totality of what God has prohibited us from. And in this verse, Allah mentions one of the wajibat, one of the divine commandments and he has mentioned one of the things that we should refrain from to emphasize the importance of this specific wajib and that specific muharram act wa aqimu salah out of all of the obligations that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has has placed upon us the one that is mentioned here is what Establishing the prayer. It shows you how important prayer is. That you need a constant connection to this creator. And there is no ritual that, that offers that constant remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like salah. There is no obligatory act that is legislated with, with the same level of frequency as Salah. And it's not just praying, it's establishing the prayer. It's a very specific type of prayer. Waqimu salah. And so, so salah is mentioned among all of the awamir, among all of the divine commandments, because as salatu amudu din is prayer is the pillar of, of this tradition, of this religion. Wala takunu min al mushrikeen. So Allah gives us one of the things that He expects from us, the do, and then the don't is mentioned. وَلَا تَكُونُوا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ And do not be among those who commit shirk. Now, some, when they, some people when they think of shirk, they have a very simplistic understanding of shirk. Now, inshallah, in the, in the verses, uh, in the subsequent verses, I'll speak a little bit more about uh, about shirk. But for now, why is it that Allah mentions shirk among all of the muharramat? So there are many things that Allah commanded us to do. He mentions salah because it is of the utmost importance. Among all of the muharramat, what is mentioned? Shirk. So this shows you the the gravity. Of the sin. And it seems, brothers and sisters, that all other sins stem from a type of shirk. And inshallah we'll, uh, we'll get to this. But the reason why shirk is mentioned is because it's it's a it's a grave sin. As Luqman says to his son, Ya Bunay la tu shirk billah, inna shirka la dhulmun azim. Oh my son, do not ascribe partners with God for for shirk, for polytheism, is indeed a great, it's a great form of, it's a great oppression, it's a great wrongdoing that you are inflicting upon the soul. And of course, this, uh, this shirk that's mentioned here includes the, the greater shirk, a shirk al jali, the apparent manifest polytheism, and it also refers to the subtle shirk. The subtle polytheism, which we'll uh, speak about uh, uh, shortly, inshallah. And, and that, and the lesser shirk, the subtle shirk is 
is something that uh, even believers fall into. You know, that's why in Surah uh, Yusuf, ayah number 106, Allah, when He speaks about the believers, وَمَا يُؤْمِنُ أَكْثَرُهُمْ بِاللَّهِ إِلَّا وَهُمْ مُشْرِكُونَ Many of those who believe in God, who believe in Allah, they're mu'mineen, but they have, they've polluted their hearts with some degree of shirk, which we'll uh, speak about in short. Verse number 32, a continuation uh, about uh, those who commit shirk. مِنَ الَّذِينَ فَرَّقُوا دِينَهُمْ كَانُوا شِيَعًا كُلُّ حِزْبٍ بِمَا لَدَيْهِمْ فَرِحُونَ Those who divided their religion. Now who are those who divided their religion? Those who, who are guilty, who have, who committed some level of shirk. Those who divided their religion and become factions. Each party rejoicing in that which it has. Now, it's interesting that the Quran is making a connection here between the fragmenting of the messages of prophets into different factions and sects. It's connecting that phenomenon to shirk. You take, for example, the Muslim Ummah. When did we see this fracture? in the Ummah of the Prophet. We saw it, you know, especially it became very manifest on the day of Saqifah. Yes? Now, shirk, we shouldn't only limit our understanding of shirk to say that shirk means that you, you believe that there is another God who is worthy of worship other than Allah. Imam al-Sadiq, he says that there are many who believe that Allah is the only one worthy of worship, but they associate Him when it comes to obedience. So there is what we call shirk, the uh, shirk ibadah, the polytheism of worship. And we also have the polytheism of obedience. So the, the Quran is, is asserting that the breaking of the ummah, the, the division of religion from its, its pure essence, happens because of a type of shirk. Now what do we mean by this? You take the example of Saqifah. So you have, so the, the ummah was united during the lifetime of the Prophet, and then you have this division take place after the Prophet's departure. Now, if you study Saqifah and you want to get to the root cause of what is causing this rift in the community, it, it comes down to a form of shirk. Not, not the manifest shirk where, you know, people are claiming that there are other gods along with Allah. No. It's, it's because there are people who would rather obey their own souls instead of God. So for example, in Surah Al-Jathiyah, Surah 45, ayah number 23, Allah speaks about this phenomenon. أَفَرَأَيْتَ مَنْ اتَّخَذَ إِلَاهَهُ هَوَى Have you seen the one who takes his desires as a God? So you have individuals who, who coveted political power. And because of their love for this political power, they obeyed the desires of their souls. They submitted to the desires of their soul. They obeyed their desires instead of obeying the divine commandment. This is a type of shirk. So you see that what causes the division and the formation of factions really boils down to a type of a, a type of shirk known as shirk al ta'a min alladhina farraqu deenahum kanu shi'an kullu hizbin bima ladayhim farihun and the end of the verse says each party 
rejoicing in that which it has. This is something that we see, especially you know, when, when there is division in the community, when we start assigning labels to different groups, that you belong to this camp, and you belong to that camp. When Allah says, كُلُّ حِزْبٍ بِمَا لَدَيْهِمْ فَرِحُونَ That each party rejoicing in that which it has, it refers to this, this blind allegiance, this blind support that we give to those who we see as members of our sect, members of our group. There's a beautiful, there's a beautiful insight in the story of Musa alayhi salam in Surah Al-Qasas, ayah number 18. If you, if you recall in the story of Musa, when he comes out of the palace and he's just walking in the streets, he sees an Israelite, one of his own, in a fight with an Egyptian. And Musa alayhi salam, he comes to the rescue of the Israelite because he was evidently being oppressed. He was, uh, he was being mistreated. Musa comes to his rescue and he inadvertently kills the Egyptian. The following day, the Quran says, فَأَصْبَحَ فِي الْمَدِينَةِ خَائِفًا يَتَرَتَّبْ فَإِذَا الَّذِ اسْتَنْصَرَهُ بِالْأَمْسِ يَسْتَصْرِخُهُ Musa sees the same guy, the same Israelite. He's in a fight, he's in an altercation with another Egyptian. And he's yelling, he's calling out to Musa for help yet again. What does Musa say? قَالَ لَهُ مُوسَىٰ إِنَّكَ لَغَوِيٌّ مُّبِينٌ You are in manifest error. You are clearly misguided. So here you see that Musa doesn't just side with the Israelite because, you know, hey, he's one of us. You know, kind of like how many people, oh, he's, he's a Shia, I'm on his side. He's a Sunni, I'm on his side. That's not how we should be. We shouldn't have this blind, you know, unconditional support and allegiance for people just because we see them as members of our own group. But we have to be rational. We have, our, our allegiance, our unconditional allegiance should be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to justice. كُلُّ حِزْبٍ بِمَا لَدَيْهِمْ فَرِحُونَ Verse number 33. Now again, this is an elaboration uh, on the concept of, uh, of fitra. وَإِذَا مَسَّ النَّاسَ ضُرٌ دَعَوْ رَبَّهُمْ مُنِيبِينَ إِلَيْهِ ثُمَّ إِذَا أَذَاقَهُمْ مِنْهُ رَحْمَةً إِذَا فَرِيقٌ مِنْهُمْ بِرَبِّهِمْ يُشْرِكُونَ and when harm befalls the people. So again, this is something that we see in, in all people. So fitrat Allah allati fatra nasa alayha. So the, the fitra is in all people. So this is an example of what is meant by this fitra. So if we say that all people are born with this innate recognition of God, when does that, that primordial nature surface? Allah says, وَإِذَا مَسَّ النَّاسَ ضُرٌ دَعَوْ رَبَّهُمْ مُنِيبِينَ إِلَيْهِ And when harm befalls the people, they call upon their Lord, turning to Him. ثُمَّ إِذَا أَذَاقَهُمْ مِّنْهُ رَحْمَةً إِذَا فَرِيقٌ مِّنْهُمْ بِرَبِّهِمْ يُشْرِكُونَ Then when He lets them taste of His mercy, Behold, a group of them associate partners unto their Lord. Now here, the word ضُرْ is mentioned. وَإِذَا مَسَّ النَّاسَ ضُرٌ دَعَوْ رَبَّهُمْ مُنِيبِينَ Now ضُرْ here refers to, you know, a type of, a type of harm that shakes us. You know, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's like comparable to an airplane that's about to crash or a violent uh, earthquake or a violent tornado. Or if, if people are in the middle of the sea and they, they capsize and they fall into the water in the middle of a storm, it's something that, that, that really makes people lose hope. They fear for their, 
their lives. Allah says that when harm falls the peop befalls the people, when harm befalls the people, they call upon their Lord. وَإِذَا مَسَّ النَّاسَ ضُرٌ دَعَوْ رَبَّهُمْ They call upon, not Allah, their Lord. Allah, the word رَبَّهُمْ is used. So part of the fitrah is that not only do they recognize that there is a higher power, but their fitrah tells them that that higher power cares about me. وَإِذَا مَسَّ النَّاسَ ضُرٌ دَعَوْ رَبَّهُمْ they reach out to their Rabb. They have this innate, you know, they never took a Aqa'id class. They never studied theology. They have this innate recognition that not only do I have a creator. So, you know, it's not that they're deists. That, yeah, I know there's a creator, but he doesn't care. I don't have a personal God. No. When there is, a, when they're struck with a severe, when severe harm befalls them, when they feel that their lives are in danger, they reach out. They know that they have a Rabb, they have a sustainer, a personal God who cares about them. Munibina ilay, and they turn to him. So this is where you see the fitra. So the fitra can be suppressed because of societal forces. But when the human being is in a state of extreme distress, the fitra comes to the surface. But what happens? Thumma, after some time, إِذَا أَذَاقَهُمْ مِنْهُ رَحْمَةً But Allah says when, when He lets them taste of His mercy, when Allah relieves them, when He rescues them, إِذَا فَرِيقٌ مِنْهُمْ بِرَبِّهِمْ يُشْرِكُونَ Behold, when, they're, when Allah, when, when they taste His mercy, when He saves them, when He rescues them, Behold, a group of them ascribe partners unto their Lord. And this is what I referenced earlier uh, when I mentioned Surah Yusuf, Surah 12, Ayah 106, where Allah even speaks about how common this is even among mu'mineen. Now what does it mean when Allah says that they ascribe partners to Him? So for example, imagine you're you're on a cruise or you're you're in an airplane and the engine goes out in the middle of the air, God forbid. And the oxygen masks, you know, fall down, they they, they come down, and you can hear the panic in the captain's voice that now you're plummeting towards the earth. Believe me, in those moments Everyone, whether they're saying it verbally or not, everyone's heart is reaching out to Allah. All this is a fact. But what happens? Let's say the pilot is able to make, at the last second, he's able to make a safe emergency landing. You know, just like the pilot who landed in the Hudson River. What do people do? When they when they make it safely, when they survive, what do they do usually? Do they say, Alhamdulillah, thank you God? Who do they give credit to? They give credit to who? They give credit to the pilot. I have a terminal illness. You are begging God. And then what happens when you're cured? You thank the... Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that you shouldn't thank the pilot or you shouldn't thank the physician. But the problem is... We often assign independence to these human beings. You know, there's a uh, there's a beautiful hadith from Imam Al Sadiq where he explains the meaning of that ayah from Surah Yusuf, Surah Twelve, Ayah One Hundred Six, where Allah says, well, and, "And most of them do not believe in their Lord unless they ascribe partners to Him." When Imam al-Sadiq was asked, what is the meaning of this? How are they mu'mineen and, and most of them ascribe partners to God? Imam al-Sadiq, he says, يقول, It is like that man who says, it is like that person who says, فلان, It's like that person who says, 
if it wasn't for so-and-so, I would have perished. That this person saved my life. You know, they, God is not even in the equation for them. No, theoretically, they might, yeah, they might believe in God, but practically, when they're offering gratitude, when, you know, the way that they conduct themselves doesn't reflect this, this belief that they have. Imam al-Sadiq says that it is like that person who says is that because of so-and-so, if it wasn't for so-and-so, I would have perished. Or it is like that person who says, If it wasn't for such and such person, I would have faced this great hardship. This person bailed me out. If it wasn't for this person, my family would have suffered. You know, this person got me a job. May God bless him. He doesn't thank Allah. You know, why you can thank the person for being a wasila, an instrument that God used to deliver his blessing to you. And then the Imam says, Allah Tara Annahu Kajala Lillahi Sharik and Fi Mulkihi Yarzukuhu Wayatfawan. Don't Imam Sadak says, Don't you see how such a person has made a partner with God who sustains and who repels harm? So the man says to Imam al-Sadiq, what if I say, Lawla anna allaha manna alayya bi fulan illa halakt? What if, oh Imam, what if I say, if, if God did not send this person to me, I would have perished. The Imam says, there's no problem in saying that. So we also have to train ourselves, brothers and sisters, that, you know, when we recover from an illness, yes, we thank the, the doctor, but we, we should say things like, you know, if Allah did, if God did not send you to me, or if I, if, if God did not direct me to you, I would have suffered greatly. So when we express our gratitude, even to people, we have to be God-centric in the way that we express that gratitude. Sometimes we see the, we see, you know, the, uh, the, the sebab, we see the direct cause of our healing but we don't see the the ultimate cause of our healing and our salvation and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is why Imam al-Sadiq he says inna shirk akhfa min dabib nam that shirk is more subtle than the crawling of an ant it's very subtle you know some of us we we think that we're pure monotheists but in our interactions in our behavior that monotheism is not there it's not reflected we see we we attribute so much praise and we put so much faith in the alarm system that we have that we install that that we think protects our houses that alarm system has no independence it is allah through that alarm system when we take the medicine you know, we, we have so much confidence in this tablet. And sometimes we act as though this tablet independently provides me healing. But it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the, the tablet. So we have to have a very tawhidi outlook on, uh, on life. And the reason why we people fall into this type of shirk is you know, it's it's the nature of, you know, there, there's a distinction that we need to make between alam al-mulk and alam al-malakut. You know, the problem is because we live in a world where there is this chain of cause and effect, we often get blinded by the chain of cause and effect that we forget about the creator of the, the system of cause and effect. So in the Quran, reality is there are two terms that refer to creation. There's alam al-mulk and there's alam al-malakut. Alam al-mulk is that visible realm which operates through the chain of cause and effect. And that's why people in alam al-mulk, that's why people in dunya, they ascribe partners to God. Because they get blinded by the chain of cause and effect. They see the sabab, but they, they miss the hand of the musabbib. And then you have Alam al-Malakut, which is the, that invisible realm that doesn't go through that chain of cause and effect. That chain of cause and effect 
is something that is in the background. It's faint. And everything in Alam al-Malakut is directly, its connection to God is very visible. It's very apparent. And this is why Allah revealed, He showed Ibrahim Alam al-Malakut. If you go to Surah Al-An'am, Surah 6, Ayah 75, what does Allah say? وَكَذَلِكَ نُرِيَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ مَلَكُوتُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَلِيَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُقِنِينَ Allah says, and, 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 and that is, and such we have, we have shown Ibrahim the malakut of the heavens and the earth, so he, so he would be among those who have certainty. But why does Ibrahim have this yaqeen? Because he sees that every particle in this universe is directly connected to God. So there is no shirk in, in his heart. Because someone who has that level of purity, the veils are removed and removed until he's able to see creation in its essence. That everything is linked to God. Verse number 34. لِيَكْفُرُوا بِمَا آتَيْنَاهُمْ فَتَمَتَّعُوا فَسَوْفَ تَعْلَمُونَ Let them be ungrateful for that which we have given them. So enjoy yourselves, for soon you will know. Now, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Let them be ungrateful, for that which we have given them. It's important to remember that when Allah expresses His anger over the ingratitude of, of people, it's not because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala benefits from our gratitude, nor is it because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is harmed by our ingratitude. Allah's anger is really rooted in his love for us. I mean, it's, it's the same reason why our parents become angry with us when we don't eat healthy. Why do they get angry? Because when you eat junk food, you're harming yourself. When you, when you are ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you commit shirk, when you orient your heart towards anything other than him, you are moving towards your own destruction. You're, move, you're going into the wilderness. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He says, let them be ungrateful. لِيَكْفُرُوا بِمَا آتَيْنَهُمْ For what we have given them. So enjoy yourselves. فَتَمَتَّعُوا Now of course when Allah says, so enjoy yourselves, this is not you know, a command in the sense that Allah is commanding you to go enjoy yourselves. You know, in عِلْمُ الْبَلَاثَ in, in Arabic rhetoric, you learn that Commands serve different purposes. Sometimes a command implies obligation, like aqim as-sala, establish prayer. And sometimes a command is a threat, right? So here a command functions as a threat. فَتَمَتَّعُوا It doesn't mean that Allah, oh, alhamdulillah, Allah has given us the green light to go enjoy ourselves. It's kind of like, you know, when your parents say, if they tell you, you know, don't play video games, and, and 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 they and they see you moving towards the console, and they say, "Yeah, go play, play, play that video game." You know that 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 command is not permission; it's a threat, meaning that do it, and you'll see what's going to happen. So enjoy yourselves, for soon you will know. Soon you will know, meaning that this life is fleeting. It is moving so quickly, you know, as the Quran says, إِنَّهُمْ يَرَوْنَهُ بَعِيدًا وَنَرَاهُ قَرِيبًا You think that the Day of Judgment is this distant event, something that will happen in the distant future, but Allah says, we see it as something that is very near. For soon you will know. Soon you will know what? Soon you will know the consequence of searching for refuge in others other than Allah. That you will realize that, that you this was all self-harm. 
you were harming yourself and you were, you were negligent and you were heedless of uh, these uh, divine instructions. Verse number 35, أَمْ أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ سُلْطَانًا فَهُوَ يَتَكَلَّمُ بِمَا كَانُوا بِهِ يُشْرِكُونَ Or have we sent down upon them any authority that speaks of their of that that speaks of that which they ascribe as partners to him? Now there is no rational reason to ascribe partners with God. There is no scriptural evidence for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having partners or associates. So here when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, this fact that we insist on ascribing partners to God, Allah says, where do you get this from? Why are you so obsessed with shirk? Do you have rational evidence for it? So here Sultan is understood when Allah says, or have we sent down upon you any authority? Meaning, do you have scriptural evidence that indicates that God has a partner? That, that I have created something else for you that will, that will give you that that tranquility and that peace that you are thirsty for. In uh, in surah in surah number thirty five, ayah number forty, again, Allah subhanahu wa taala questions those who ascribe partners to Him. Mada khalaqu min al ardi am lahum shirkun fi samawat? What have your gods created on earth? Do they have a partnership with me in the heavens? Do they have a claim? Do they have a share of the creation of the heavens? Are you making these claims because of, of a book that we have revealed to you? So again, emphasis on backing up what you believe with evidence. That, that you should not blindly believe anything. That you have to have evidence for uh, for your belief system, and then the uh, the final verse, ayah number thirty six. وَإِذَا أَذَقْنَا النَّاسَ رَحْمَةً فَرِحُوا بِهَا وَإِن تُصِبْهُمْ سَيِّئَةٌ بِمَا قَدَّمَتْ أَيْدِيهِمْ إِذَا هُمْ يَقْنَطُونَ And when we cause the people to taste some mercy, they rejoice in it. But should an evil befall them because of that which their hands have sent forth, they despair. Now, there may seem like a contradiction between this verse and the previous verse. In the previous verse, in ayah number 33, when Allah was, when there was an, an, an elaboration on the concept of fitrah, what does Allah say? وَإِذَا مَسَّ النَّاسَ ضُرٌ دَعَوْ رَبَّهُمْ مُنِيبِينَ إِلَيْهِ and when harm befalls them, befalls the people, they call upon their Lord, turning to Him. Here in ayah number 36, Allah says, وَإِن تُصِبْهُمْ سَيِّئَةٌ بِمَا قَدَّمَتْ أَيْدِيهِمْ إِذَا هُمْ يَقْنَطُونَ But should an evil befall them because of that which their hands have set forth, they despair. So there seems to be a contradiction here. Now, as I mentioned, ayah number 33, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about ضُرْ وَإِذَا مَسَّ النَّاسَ ضُرٌ دَعَوْ رَبَّهُمْ مُنِيبِينَ إِلَيْهِ ضُرْ in ayah number 33 refers to those moments of extreme distress when people feel like their lives are in danger. You know, like a natural disaster. Someone is on the verge of losing their lives. A plane is about to crash. You're in the middle of a violent storm. The hearts of people naturally incline towards God. In ayah number 36, this is a reference to the bad things that happen to us in life. You know, whether they're you know, poverty, sickness, that are often a result of our own actions. And this verse, so, so number one, before I get to that, just a, a short uh, thought uh, related to the first part of the verse. وَإِذَا أَذَقْنَا النَّاسَ رَحْمَةً فَرِحُوا بِهَا When we cause the people to taste some mercy, they rejoice in it. Now what is it now? Of course, there's nothing wrong with 
with rejoicing when Allah blesses you. But here, the rejoicing is, is a delusional rejoice. And this is referenced in Surah Zukhruf, in Surah 39, verse 49, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِذَا مَسَّ الْإِنسَانَ ضُرٌ دَعَانَ When people are afflicted with harm, they call upon us, that extreme harm, that extreme distress. ثُمَّ إِذَا خَوَّلْنَاهُ نِعْمَةً مِنَّا But when we confer upon them a blessing, قَالَ إِنَّمَا أُوْتِيتُهُ عَلَىٰ عِلْمٍ That I earned this blessing because of my knowledge. That they, they imagine that what they procure procure in, in blessings is a result of their own business savviness. That they're just geniuses. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here says that they take credit for the good that happens to them. They say that this is because we're brilliant, we're knowledgeable, we're skillful. وَإِن تُصِبْهُمْ Now look at the language of this verse. وَإِذَا أَذَقْنَا النَّاسَ رَحْمَةً And when we cause the people to taste some mercy. So Allah's rahmah is inevitable. But when Allah speaks about the evil effects of our actions, Allah says, وَإِن تُصِبْهُمْ سَيِّئَةٌ بِمَا قَدَّمَتْ أَيْدِيهِمْ But should an evil befall them, that is a conditional sentence, meaning a lot of the evil, a lot of the difficulties that we face in life were actually avoidable. A lot of the difficulties were avoidable because a lot of our suffering is caused by our own sins. You know, sometimes, you know, in, in, in many cases, you know, if you look at the life of a human being, it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that more than half Maybe 70% of the hardships that we face are consequences of our actions, meaning that they are the effects of sins that we commit. So Allah's rahmah, it's just a matter of when His rahmah is going to come. It's, it's something that's available. It's inevitable. But the, the evil that we experience, the suffering that we experience, a lot of it was avoidable. You know, even if you even if you look at the the coronavirus, Allah knows how it began, but I wouldn't be surprised if if a lot of these diseases are are caused by people consuming things that the Sharia prohibits us from consuming. A lot of diseases that 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 have that take place usually appear because people were engaging in something that that wasn't permitted by the Sharia. And, and this is supported by a tradition from Imam al-Ridha alayhi salam. Imam al-Ridha, he says, it's an amazing hadith. He says, كُلَّمَا أَحْدَثَ الْعِبَادُ مِنَ الذُّنُوبِ مَا لَمْ يَكُونُوا يَعْمَلُونَ أَحْدَثَ اللَّهُ لَهُمْ مِنَ الْبَلَاءِ مَا لَمْ يَكُونُوا يَعْرِفُونَ Imam Ali ibn Musa al-Ridha alayhi salam, he says, when people commit a new sin that they've never committed before, they invent a new sin. Allah creates a new calamity that they never knew before. SubhanAllah. As we become innovative in the way that we transgress, Allah says, I am also innovative in the, in the, in the new forms of tribulations that I will introduce to you. And then one final hadith, again, going back to this idea of, you know, when, when we suffer, we automatically blame Allah. Oh Allah, why is this happening to me? But we're not introspective. We don't think to ourselves that this tribulation is a direct result of me not following the Sharia. That a lot of our suffering is because of our disobedience of Allah. Imam, and in fact, in many cases, you and I die before our appointed time, meaning we die before we reach our, before we live out our full potential with respect to our longevity. Imam al Sadiq, he says, Man yamutu bil dhunub akthar mimman yamutu bil ajab. Those who die as a result of their sins are more than those who die because they've reached the full term of 
the life that Allah has decreed for them. So for example, if Allah decrees that your lifespan, you can live anywhere between 70 to 90 years, that your maximum allotted time is 90 years. Imam al-Sadiq says, most people die before the maximum allotted time. They die because of their sins. They die, Allah shortens their lifespan, for example, because they severed ties with their nearest of kin. Because they committed zina, for example, Allah shortens their lifespan. So you see, Allah says, in tusibhum, this in is a conditional particle, which means that a lot of the suffering that we experience was not necessary. It, it didn't need to happen. It was just a, co a natural consequence of our actions. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bless us and guide us and illuminate our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad and Muhammad. Wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala muhammad wa alihi ta'aleen. Allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ali muhammad. Any questions or comments? I apologize, I think the, the lesson was a bit long today, but uh, hopefully we didn't lose anyone who won't fall asleep. No need to apologize for uh, longer lessons. Any uh, questions or comments? Um, could you talk a bit about what is the difference between performing Salat and establishing Salat? So, among the things that scholars mention is that establishing the prayer refers really to two main things. Observing the external etiquettes of the prayer, okay? Meaning that, that you're, you're observing the, the proper fiqh, observing the external etiquettes of the prayer. You know, paying attention to some of the, the mustahabbat of the prayer, establishing it. So you have the external etiquettes, you know, removing distractions, wearing proper clothes when you stand for salah, uh, applying fragrances, really treating salah as, as it should be treated, as an encounter, as a private audience with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But most importantly is observing the internal etiquettes of the prayer is that you come to the prayer with hudur al with with the presence of heart and it's difficult to achieve that presence of heart to focus in our prayers and the reason why it's difficult for us to focus in our prayers is because we we try to jump into the prayer without preparing our hearts and our minds for the prayer you know you're you should be preparing yourself for salah before you even reach the prayer mat, meaning that you should be preparing your heart and your mind for salah while you're performing wudu. You know, this is why we have those recommended adhkar. You know, when you wash your face, there's a recommended dhik, and when you wash your arms, when you wipe your head, when you wipe your feet. You know, and, and this is this is something that the Ahlul Bayt salam teach us. And and sometimes it takes effort. You know, especially if you had a very rough day and you have a million things going through your mind, it would it would help to sit on your prayer mat, close your eyes, and just you know regulate your breathing, just to kind of prepare your mind. You know, read a hadith or two about the virtue of prayer, about the greatness of Allah, and then then begin the uh, the prayer. So establishing the prayer, it, it's it's about observing. The uh, the internal and the internal uh, the external and the internal etiquette of the uh, of the salah. It's establishing it. You know, it takes work. It's not just about going through the motions. So my my recommendation would be to get into the habit of uh, of uh, of reciting. The, you know, think think about think of uh, of wudu as an ibadah. You know, we often think of wudu as the thing that I have to do. Before I begin my ibadah. But wudu itself is an ibadah. If you don't do wudu with the intention of seeking nearness to God, wudu is batil. 
So, so wudu really functions as a, a mental preparation and a spiritual preparation for the prayer. So if you feel that your mind is clouded, sit, don't begin the prayer until you, you've cleared your mind, until you feel that you're ready for, uh, for that encounter. I mean, imagine you have an interview with, with the CEO of a company and it's a really important job and they, you know, it's a life changing, uh, interview. And, you know, obviously you're going to have a routine. You know, you're going to prepare for it. You're, you're not going to walk into that meeting until you feel that you're prepared. Right? You're going to do whatever it takes to calm yourself and to, uh, to, to ensure that, that you, that you're, you're primed for that encounter. So the same thing applies to prayer. And believe me, brothers and sisters, something as simple as wearing your best clothes when you pray psychologically, it conditions you to really reflect on who you're speaking to. You know, the problem is when you and I pray, we wear, we wear things in our salah that we wouldn't wear in front of our neighbors, in front of our children. We dress as though we are homeless when we stand before Allah. But when we want to stand in front of a human being, we make sure that we're dressed par- properly. And so, you know, Imam al Hassan, for example, he used to wear his finest clothes when he stood for prayer. So this is something that we should try. That we have to, we have to, uh, we have to mentally prepare ourselves for the sun. So this is just, you know, in a nutshell, what, uh, what establishing prayer means. And uh, on the, what we're talking about, when you don't, do not be among people who commit shirk, uh, does this mean to not be one of the people who are committing shirk, or does it also mean don't even spend time with such people? So it depends. I mean, so obviously, so the verse, without a doubt, is, uh, is, is instructing us to not be among those who, who commit shirk, meaning that don't commit shirk yourself. But if you feel that someone, someone is having a negative influence on you, they're taking you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then, and, and if you feel that you don't have any way of, of rectifying them or bringing them closer to Allah, so if, if someone is having a bad influence on you, and you feel that they are distancing you from Allah, that relationship is a liability. But if you feel that someone you know, has some bad qualities, but you feel that you can be a positive influence on them, then there, that's, that's, that's praiseworthy to, to, to interact with, interact with them and befriend them with that intention to kind of bring them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the, uh, the verse, uh, the verse seems to, uh, to indicate that, you know, uh, do not be among the polytheists, meaning don't, don't be a polytheist yourself. There were a couple questions about the predestination. So how, how do you ascertain our lifespan and is not the date and the way we die pre-med, predetermined by Allah? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what the final, you know, you know. so for example, this apportionment you know, of say, let's say, so life, your lifespan is determined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the sense that he has allotted a, sp- a lifespan for you. Let's say 50 to 70 years. Now, of course, Allah knows and, and you're, you play a role in determining what, what that number will be, what the final decree will be. Now, the malaika, the malaika, they don't, they don't know the final figure, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has that knowledge. But the reason why that figure is given is because it's to, it's to reveal to us that we also play a role in our own destiny. So yes, that life and death is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So your death is known to God, but you play a role. So for example, paying charity, maintaining ties with your, uh, with your family members, these all can extend a person's lifespan. So someone, if they sever relations with their family, say they might die at the age of 55, but they had the potential to live till 70. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what decisions that we're going to make, but that that span 
is uh is is there to kind of uh to to inculcate in us this idea that our actions also shape the uh the final decree and verse 32 um, it talks about the people who divided the religions and each sect rejoices in what they have. Yeah. Uh, the part about rejoicing in what they have, um, is that also referring to people thinking that they're more special compared to the other groups? It, I mean, it, it could be in the sense that if it's stemming from a delusional rejoicing, meaning that it's a it's an uncritical kind of blind allegiance that, you know, whatever you say is true because we are we are members of the same community. Then yes, that that is uh, that is definitely uh, uh, problematic. And all sins be forgiven by Dova. Yes, all all sins in this life. Are forgivable and uh, through Toba. So the narrations say that the do the door of repentance. You have the opportunity to repent up until the the ruh reaches the throat, meaning up until the moment before the soul departs from the body. If someone rep repents sincerely, Allah will accept their Toba. But again. Not everyone gets, you know, Tawbah also requires Tawfiq. You know, there are many people who, when they're on their deathbed, they don't, they don't realize that they think that they're going to recover, but in a few minutes, their health declines and they're so panicked that it doesn't even occur to them to repent. So we have to, we have to ask Allah to give us the Tawfiq to make Tawbah because, you know, there are many people who you might think are Muslims, but you know they, they've they've lived sinful lives. They were so corrupt that who knows if they died on Islam, really? And there might be someone who you think is not a non-Muslim, but they lived a righteous life, and Allah gives them hidayah when they're on their deathbed, and they died recognizing God, recognizing His oneness. But everyone thinks that they died as a non-Muslim. So the point is that we have to ask Allah for husn al aqibah We have to ask Allah to give us a good end. And part of having a good end is having the, the tawfiq to, to repent. To repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, for verse 35, uh, where Allah was asking about any uh, evidence for associate for, for performing shirk, and that you mentioned that we think that something else might give us the tranquility and peace that we're searching for. Um, nowadays, it doesn't feel like people are actually searching for tranquility and peace. They're looking for happiness and other mechanisms, in other words. Mm -hmm. Could you maybe talk a bit about how people search for happiness today and why that is not the, might not be the right approach? Now, when I say tranquility, happiness, peace, it, it's really all the same thing. I mean, you know, people do the things that they do because they think it's going to improve the quality of their lives. Let's put it that way. Now, <clears throat> again, shirk is is a very broad concept. You know, when we think of shirk, we, we usually think of 7th century Arabia where they're bowing to wooden idols and statues. You know, shirk is, is, is much more sophisticated than that. It's a very broad concept. And it's it's this idea of having confidence and putting faith in things other than God in the hopes that you will you will taste that happiness that you're searching for in things that are that are not related to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And and we see this today, you know, people, you know, whether you know, Muslims and non Muslims alike, you know, they you know they they claim to to believe in God, they they claim to uh to believe in his oneness. But practically, you know, like, you know, for example, many youth today, many, they, they smoke weed, they smoke marijuana. Why? They do it because it, they say it, it gives, it gives me, it makes me feel relaxed. It makes me feel relaxed. 
You know, brothers, there's there's an ayah in the Quran that says, "Ala bi dhikrillahi tatmainu al qulub." That verily, with the remembrance of Allah, the hearts are tranquil. That this this inner peace that people are trying to, that are searching for this happiness, they're searching for it in all the wrong places. And you find that Subhanallah, people who who spend their lives amassing wealth amassing all of these materialistic possessions they end up it's it's like a mirage it's something that they were chasing and when they finally reach it they still don't feel fulfilled you know this is why people have you know mid, mid uh, you know midlife crisis some people have quarter life you know crises and, and so on and so forth and it's not a coincidence that the united states which is the the, the most affluent country in the world also has the highest rate of people taking antidepressants, prescription drugs. Is it because they don't have a roof over their head? Is it because many of them, they don't have food to eat? Alhamdulillah, they're, materialistically, they're doing much better than most of the world. What's missing? What's missing is that, you know, a lot of people, they, they don't have, they don't have, there's a spiritual poverty. You know, people talk about the, the coronavirus pandemic, we have something even more serious than the coronavirus, which is a, a the spiritual poverty that has uh, engulfed the world. People feel this emptiness and they will continue to feel this emptiness because the heart of the human being will never be satiated with anything other than Allah. And this is a reality. Some people will learn it the hard way and some people won't, won't, won't need to learn it the hard way. They'll, they'll realize the truth of that statement. And could you, uh, we talked a little bit about this during the class, but uh, could you just kind of describe the main types of shirt that uh, believers may need to watch out for that might be at risk of committing? So uh, so we have, of course, the the greatest form of shirk, shirk al jali, you know, shirk al akbar, which is to actually believe that there is more than one deity, more than one god. There is the uh, the, the shirk that I that I mentioned, which is uh, shirk al khafi. It's it's you know, for example, assigning uh, independence, even if it's done unintentionally, it's assigning independence. To, uh, to the things that, uh, to, to, to God's creation, you know, assigning independence to the medicine, to the doctor, to the pilot, and not seeing them as being totally dependent on God, and God is the, the ultimate cause. That's a type of, uh, shirk, you know, a, a shirk in, uh, in Rububiyyah. There is also, uh, shirk al ta'a, right? So, you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands one thing, but for example, your culture, you know, might give, give more weight to something else that is contrary to the sharia and, and you follow your cultural uh, tradition. This is a type of shirk. This is shirk al ta'a. So instead of obeying God, you obeyed a cultural practice. You obeyed a certain, uh, you know, community figure. This is a type of, uh, shirk. You have also the shirk of, of, uh, the, the showing off, you know, seeking the uh, the praise of people, the attention of people. This is a this is a type of shirk. So there are many there. You know, for every type of tawheed, there is there is a type of uh, shirk. And some scholars have have listed, you know, thirteen or fourteen aspects of tawheed. And of course, you know, the opposite of that would be uh would be shirk. So there 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 are some who believe. In the oneness of the Creator, but they believe that they they do shirk in rububiyyah. For example, like the 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 Meccans, the Quraysh, they believe that Allah is is the only Creator, but they also believe that these gods they manage different pockets of the universe. So their shirk was not in al khaliqiya it was in rububiyyah. And then you might have someone who has the shirk in ba'a, and then the the shirk of love, the shirk of of uh, of obedience and, and so on and so on. The last question, if uh, you have time for it. Sure. 
Um, why are we asked to recite Surah Rum on 23rd Ramazan and during Shabbat Why are we, uh, <clears throat> why are we asked to we don't really know, brothers and sisters. You know, when uh, when the imams of Ahlul Bayt make these recommendations, unless they themselves explain, you know, uh, because at, at the end of the day, we're asking about something related to the uh, to the actions of God, fi'lullah. You know, why does God command us to do certain things? And when the imams command us to do things, it's it's equivalent to God commanding us to do it. You know, why does Allah command us to do certain things? We don't know unless they unless they explain, unless they clarify. What's the hikmah behind it? You know, perhaps one of the themes, and I guess I, I put perhaps in all caps, and I underline it. Perhaps, you know, you know, Laylat al-Qadr is, uh, is, a, uh, is, you know, the night of destiny. And in, in Surah Al-Rum, in Surah Al-Ankabut, in Surah Al-Dukhan, you know, one of the common themes is, of course, Tawheed, the, the hereafter. And also, it speaks a lot about the fate of previous nations. There's a lot of discussion about the fate of previous nations. Now, in the, in the, in the, uh, in Qadr, one of the most recommended things to do is to recite dua. And one of the th- unique features of dua is a dua yaruddu al qada wa law ubrima ibrama. That dua has the power to reverse things that have been decreed. So if we've done things that have made us deserving of punishment, like those past nations, we can reverse our destiny through, through dua. So it's to learn from the uh, the transgressions and the iniquities of past nations is to be reminded of the omnipotence of God. To also be reminded that this life is is temporary and our final abode, our real life, uh, is what's on the other side. And uh, so perhaps because the themes of these surahs are related to uh, Layal al Qadr and, and our destiny and, and what we can learn from the past, maybe this is why these surahs are uh, recommended. And Allah knows best. Thank you very much, Shaykh. Jazakumullah. Thank you so much for all of the thoughtful questions. And uh, and uh, please forgive me for uh, any shortcomings or any inadequate explanations. Uh, I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the tawfiq to continue uh, these reflections. Jazakumullah.